Hello and welcome to Hidden History, Understanding the Origins of Racial Inequity. This is the third panel, the third and final in our series. I'm Brian Connie Bear from ABC 57 News in South Bend, your host for this discussion on the role that historical events have played in the creation and the perpetual perpetuation of racial imbalances in American society. The history we all learned in school is only part of our country's actual history, and sometimes the parts that are overlooked can illustrate how things came to be the way they are. Recent events, including the killing of George Floyd just over one year ago in Minneapolis to the January 6th assault at the U.S. Capitol building in Washington, D.C., have heightened interests in the differences in how Black and white Americans view and experience the country that we all share. Now, this is the third of three panel discussions that span the scope of American history. The three members of panel three will focus on the most recent period of the country's history from the beginning of the 20th century until today. Now, after the presentations, there will be plenty of time for you to submit questions to one or all of our guests, you can submit them through the Zoom Q&A function down there at the bottom of your screen. These panel discussions are sponsored by Spectrum Health Lakeland Medical Center and its Community Grand Rounds Initiative and by Lake Michigan College with the cooperation of the city of St. Joseph. Our goal in these discussions isn't to cover every aspect of American history. That would take a lot longer than 90 minutes and three sessions, but really to highlight some of the specific events that while they may not be all that well known to most people can help us understand how race-based inequality came to be here in our country. Uh, let's get started by introducing our panelists here for this evening. Randall Jelks is a professor at the University of Kansas and the author of a book on the struggle for civil rights in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Tim Madigan is a journalist and author of a highly regarded book on the Tulsa race massacre of 1921. And Tom Titus is a professor at DePaul University in Chicago and the author of a book that examines domestic terrorist groups here in the U.S., including white supremacist groups. We'll begin with Professor Randall Jelks. In the post-Reconstruction era, some cities in the North and, and the South, for that matter, saw the development of self-reliant Black communities, despite the existence of all those Jim Crow laws. Professional and religious leaders in these neighborhoods persisted in the struggle to attain the full measure of individual civil rights for African Americans, while at the same time pushing for equal treatment under the law for their own professions and their own businesses. The city of Grand Rapids, Michigan, is one of those locations. We will turn the floor over now to Professor Jelks. Sir, the floor is yours. Thank you. I want to uh, discuss with you today, um, uh, just this afternoon, uh, health struggles uh, and uh, black, what I call black communities in the struggle for equitable medical care. And a case study in uh, Black health professionals. And I, I have to set this up for you. Uh, and I'm going to use some illustrations from Grand Rapids. I'm going to use illustrations uh, from uh, uh, other places as well. But I wanted to set this up for you so that you begin to understand um, uh, the kind of struggles that uh, all African Americans have, if, even if we examine Grand Rapids. Like I'm a typical teacher, so I always give my students something uh, to take away. So you're my students for a moment. You should recognize some things called the, the National Medical Association, Howard University College of Medicine, Sophie B. Jones, uh, Lucy, Meharry College of Medicine, Asheville, Tennessee, Plessy versus, versus Ferguson, J. Marion Sims, and Spelman College. Just so to have some ideas of where we're going. And of course, uh, uh, the American Medical Association, uh, which was founded and incorporated, founded in 1847 and incorporated in 1897. The AMA was founded amid systematic enslavement. This is very important for us to know that the United States was built off of labor, free labor, ex, uh, extreme labor of African-Americans. So, it was founded two years after Frederick Douglass uh, wrote his uh, 1845 memoir narrative of life of uh, Frederick Douglass, an American slave. 
uh, the AMA was incor incorporated, interesting enough, one year uh, after U.S. Supreme Court ruling Plessy versus Ferguson, which I will talk about more in a, in a second. Uh, medical treatment for African Americans, I, uh, a period, was primarily around the his issue of making sure our laborers had treatment. So this is actual document. I always, I'm a historian, so I want to give you documents. I don't want to you go away thinking I'm making up stuff. Um, these are actually documents how to manage the plantation, how to make sure you take care of uh, the uh, the slaves medical treatment because you need people to get up and go to work every day. So let, so healthcare was based on uh, the ability to go and cut down trees, um, uh, plant and grow and other things. Uh, and, and sometimes in the in, in US history, we, we think of slavery as just about color, uh, the, the pigmentation of one's skin, but it's actually about labor and it's the most extreme forms of labor uh, you can get uh, the most extreme free labor, but you have to, like any labor force, you have to have some system of care for it. And this began in and under the conditions of slavery, not just in the United States. Slavery went out throughout the Americas, uh, from, from Argentina all the way up uh, to, to Canada and, uh, and the French. One of the interesting things about slavery is that slaves could be uh, uh, experimented on. Uh, J. Marion Sims, who was called the father of uh, gynecology, could do surgery on an enslaved without consent. This is a famous painting of uh, J. Marion Sims and the slave woman, Lucy, who he experimented on uh, to uh, uh, attempt to, to uh, get conditions. So, as a slave, in one being enslaved, one has no consent over one's body or what's going to happen to you if you happen to be owned by another person. So no, no consent. And this is a, a prevailing legacy when we discuss vaccinations, when we discuss other kinds of things that have gone on in recent times in the pandemic. People, people in black communities have long memories that at one time or another, women particularly could be sterilized without consent, uh, experimented on without consent. Uh, but, and the, the idea that people felt less pain than any other group of people. Uh, so this is something what we have to keep in mind as we set up the, the kind of conversation. It's not an, until after the Civil War that kind of institutions are begin to be set up to train uh, black uh, physicians. Healthcare in black communities uh, grew from the training of black physicians at Howard University College of uh, Medicine, 1868, and Meharry Medical College, 1876, and Spelman College uh, would offer the first nursing program in the country. So Howard and, and Spelman and, and all began after those in those post reconstruction years, physicians trained by these institutions assisted in forming an organization called the National Medical Association, which replicated the AMA because most black doctors couldn't be, weren't involved professionally in the AMA, weren't invited because be, overwhelmingly because of Jim Crow laws, uh, 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 doctors, from, white doctors from the South in particular, did not want to see black doctors at an event that they were in. That was the, that's the life of our country, right? Another doctor and some ties to Michigan is uh, Sophie B. Jones, uh, who's a Canadian born American medical doctor. She's Canadian born because her family escaped the US to Canada uh, fleeing slavery. But she came back and she was the first black woman to graduate from the University of Michigan Medical School. She founded the nursing program at Spelman College and was the first black faculty member at Spelman. Even though Spelman is a historically black college in its initial phase, it was all white faculty members who uh, uh, taught black students. 
at that time. So Sophie B. Jones has this tie to, to Michigan uh, and in a, a greater history than I can give here. I want to bring up uh, Plessy versus Ferguson, the Supreme Court case, because it has something to do with health. And since this is sponsored by a Spectrum, I thought I'd focus uh, my comments around health. And I want to, uh, my friend Uhuru here is going to give us a brief explanation about the Supreme Court case, Plessy versus Ferguson. Hi, I'm Uhuru Williams. I'm a historian. And here's what you need to know in order to sound smart about Plessy versus Ferguson. The Plessy versus Ferguson case originated with Louisiana's infamous Separate Car Act of 1890. The Separate Car Act required African Americans and whites to sit in segregated compartments on public carriers in Louisiana. People at the time of the Plessy decision actually believed that it was possible to measure the amount of black blood a person had in their body. The plaintiff in the Plessy case, Homer Adolph Plessy, was actually described as seven-eighths white. Homer Plessy was arrested after he refused to give up his seat in defiance of the Separate Car Act of 1890. Plessy versus Ferguson is considered an important case because it established the doctrine of separate but equal that allowed states for the first time to legally segregate the races. One of the reasons that Homer Plessy brought suit was because of the difficulty in enforcing segregation in states like Louisiana. Louisiana had a large mixed race population, making it very difficult to determine where the line could be drawn in terms of separating the races. The doctrine of separate but equal that grew out of Plessy versus Ferguson became the standard for all segregation ordinances after that decision. Despite the Supreme Court's ruling in Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896, the first municipality or city to pass a residential segregation ordinance was Baltimore, Maryland in 1910. The Supreme Court's landmark ruling in Brown versus Board of Education in 1954 ultimately was the death knell for the doctrine of separate but equal established in Plessy versus Ferguson. Hi, I'm your... It pays to have night, uh, smart friends when I see your hero are always giving compliments. Well, the, the, the issue of Jim Crow also affected Black life, particularly around the issue of uh, tuberculosis. Death by tu tuberculosis was three times that of whites among the nine million Black Americans at the turn of the 19th to the 20th century. So tuberculosis had a deleterious effect in Black communities. And we often forget that, that when we're talking about health disparities uh, today, they've been around uh, uh, in almost every disease, from venereal disease to other things. People were not getting coverage. And this takes me to Grand Rapids. The first Black doctor uh, in Grand Rapids uh, was a man by the name of Eugene S. Browning, 18. 80 to 1955. Dr. Browning practiced medicine in Grand Rapids for 50 years. He was a graduate of the historically Black University, uh, Lincoln University in Pennsylvania in 1900. Um, when he graduated uh, from um, a De uh, Detroit uh, Medical College, now Wayne State University in 1905, he was the only African-American student in the class of 54 students. So there weren't many black doctors, right? Um, and so Eugene Browning was that first solo black doctor. And when he came into Grand Rapids, he founded the Masters Clinic, an infant uh, wellness clinic at First Community AME Church. Uh, and he, de he dedicated himself to continuous learning. And Brown later studied at the University of Chicago, University of Vienna, Austria, gaining expertise in uro urology and dermatology, he broke the racial barrier in Grand Rapids, right, by obtaining admitting privileges in local hospitals and was the first admitted to uh, practice, uh, first black doctor admitted to practice at, um, um, uh, at uh, Blodgett Hospital, which is now a part of the spectrum system. And this was all a part of the Black community's own idea of social uh, efforts for social betterment. Uh, black health concerns came out of the uh, many of the Black Protestant congregations. This is just a, 
one example of, of Dr. Browning's time, the Richard Allen Home for Colored Girls. Um, young women coming from uh, Southwest Michi uh, Michigan trying to uh, get a job. They needed a safe place to stay. Uh, when they got to the big city of Grand Rapids from places like Dewajak and Niles and even Benton Harbor. And when they got there, they came to the Richard Allen Home. So efforts for social betterments was all in black communities, whether we're talking about the North or the South. I take this uh, postcard because this is uh, the typical, uh, this is Thomas Batts who owned, uh, John Thomas Batts Inc. owned a hanger, which you hang your clothes on. And of course, this is caricature of black people migrating uh, to the city. But you have to understand that while there was no uh, Jim Crow, there was multiple ways of Jim Crowing people through degradation. And so that's very important for us to, uh, to uh, um, um, that's very important for us to know. That meant that black doctors then uh, not only had to just be doctors, uh, they had to be uh, both, uh, as they had to both be health and social advocates. Uh, this is a uh, black doctors from um, um, uh, 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 at uh, Dunbar Hospital in 1922 in Detroit, and you can see, uh, courtesy of the Bentley uh, Library at the University of Michigan, you could see that uh, uh, that that the Detroit General Hospital uh, was segregated, and this is the floor outline. And so, black doctors are now have to be social advocates. They're not just um, um, doctors, they're not just physicians, um, they now have to take, uh, take a stand on not only health, but the health of a community because it is being racially excluded. I show a movie theater here because in Grand Rapids, and it's a very important civil rights case nationally and in the state, in, 19, in 1925, uh, two physicians, Emmett Bowden, a graduate of Howard University College of Dentistry, and Eugene Alston, the second Black doctor in Grand Rapids, uh, challenged the segregated seating policy of the Keith Theater. Keith Theater was a national chain in Grand Rapids. Um, that case went to the Michigan Supreme Court in 1927, and it outlawed seating uh, um, uh, Jim Crow seating in, in public accommodations, even though Michigan by 1880s had a, a, a uh, laws on the book saying you could not segregate. Companies did anyway. And in Grand Rapids, leading the case is a dentist, one of those Howard University uh, graduates, uh, like our vice, uh, like our current sitting vice president, and Eugene Olson. Uh, a graduate of the University of Michigan Medical School uh, in 1924. One of the most, that case went to the Supreme Court in 27, but in 1925, another black doctor, uh, Dr. Sweet, O.C. and Sweet, uh, Howard University College of Medicine, again, was an African-American physician in Detroit. He is known for being charged with murder in 1925 after he and friends used armed self-defense against a hostile white mob protesting after Sweet moved into their neighborhood. Stones were thrown at his house, breaking windows. Shots were fired and one white man was killed and another wounded. Sweet, his wife and nine associates at the house, including two brothers, were all arrested and charged with murder. And I'm gonna show you a brief video clip of this right now. Dr. Ocean Sweet arrived in Detroit in 1921, a time where speakeasies and jazz music were popular here. Did you know the story of Dr. Ocean Sweet? The early 1900s was a time Detroit was growing rapidly. Immigrants flocked here to fill new jobs. They came from Europe and all over the United States. Thousands came from the South, both white and black. Resentment grew against the large stream of migrants, with the white population changing its previous attitude toward Black housing options. 
suddenly whites started to insist on a level of residential segregation they'd never insisted on before. They began to say African-Americans can live in Black Bottom, but they can't live anywhere else. Indicative of the changing mood, the membership of the Ku Klux Klan surged across the United States, including in Michigan and in Detroit. With a successful practice serving the Black community, Dr. Ocean Sweet and his wife Gladys decided to move out of Black Bottom and purchase a decent home for their growing family. They chose a house in an all-white neighborhood. Being aware of the volatile atmosphere, Dr. Sweet asked his brother and several friends to help him protect his property with guns if necessary. The night after moving in, a large crowd numbering in the hundreds formed on the street just outside the house. A dozen police were in place for protection. Suddenly, rocks started raining down on the house. Windows shattered. Then shots rang from the house. Across the street, Leon Briner, a neighborhood resident, lay dead. Police rushed in and arrested everyone in the house. The prosecutor charged all of them with first degree murder. The NAACP quickly became involved in the case, hiring the nation's foremost defense lawyer, Clarence Darrell. Darrell carefully selected a jury of white men and achieved at first a hung jury, then an acquittal. A victory in the case momentarily provided comfort to the suites but Detroit's difficulties with housing segregation would only become more problematic in the decades ahead. Now keep in mind, this home is not a museum. It's an historical site and you can come by and take a look at a piece of Detroit's history. It's located at the corner of Garland and Charlevoix. Doctor. So Black healthcare professionals are then on the forefront of all of this. Um, Maude Collin, and this is a wonderful story if you ever get a chance to go look it up, uh, was a nurse midwife in uh, South Carolina. And um, uh, she spent 13 years in Pineville so as a nurse and midwife uh, before joining the Berkeley uh, County Health Department. Her work uh, which included uh, uh, training of hundreds of midwives, took all over in parts of our county. In 1952, a Life magazine published a 12-page uh, photographic profile of her work, telling of our service to the rural poor of our county as uh, as doctor, dietitian, and psychologist. Um, so, black healthcare professionals are uh, then on the forefront of all of the kind of things we think about when we think about uh, the uh, civil rights movement, uh, when we think about, uh, but they're, they're uh, doing double duty. They're also taking care of the most distressed. Uh, and if you look at that photo essay uh, in Life Magazine in 52, you see this woman, uh, this, is, this is a movie uh, should, that should be made uh, and in, my, in, in my opinion. Uh, Maude Callen is one of those uh, midwives, uh, nurse midwives that it's, it's, it's a film to be made. The, the, the most important takeaway from this is that, that people are out here struggling to provide health care services. And finally, I wanna end this uh, brief presentation to you is that the, in my era, when I was coming up, the radical response, uh, we often hear about the Black Panther Party as this militant group of guys with guns. But the truth of the, uh, the other truth side of the Black Panther Party is it provided free school lunch and it also provided medical clinics. And interestingly enough, it was women who uh, were uh, uh, on the forefront of these uh, medical tr uh, treatments, uh, doing sickle cell anemia screenings, um, doing, uh, going to people uh, in, 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 in their neighborhoods where they live instead of asking them to come somewhere else. So here are my takeaways. Uh, African-Americans have centered their healthcare in the face of uh, racist institutional practices. Institutions that train most black healthcare professionals are historically black colleges and universities located in the South. Unfortunately, my own alma mater, the University of Michigan, is not one of those. Black healthcare professionals share the continuous 
continuous adversities that racism brings. Uh, they're serving black health face discriminatory practices as black patients they might serve. And finally, black healthcare professionals share their own health related stress in the workplace, serving a clientele who are underserved as a racial uh, racialized uh, working class. And finally, uh, you can find these great books that will give you a great introduction. Um, I have to make a one shout out here. I learned most of this stuff from my mentor, uh, Darlene Clark Hunt, who wrote this book on black nurses, black women in white. Um, uh, and so with that said, I want to stop uh, my, my presentation and, and, and let us move on. Thank you. Professor Randall Jelks, thank you very much for that fascinating detail, you know, right here in our own backyard in West Michigan, uh, and all these small fights for equality and for equal treatment and for equal rights. Uh, it, it's fascinating to see how, because this wasn't just, you know, Rosa Parks on a bus. This, this was decades and decades of small battles moving things forward. All right, we're going to move on to author Tim Madigan. The 1921 attack on a black neighborhood of Greenwood in Tulsa, Oklahoma by an armed white mob has gotten a lot of recent media coverage. We just had the 100th anniversary. But for years, the devastation of this thriving black community and the forced exodus of the African-American population there was largely, largely hidden from public consciousness. Tim Madigan brings a reporter scrutiny to the causes of the Tulsa race massacre, its roots in the Jim Crow era, and the recent attempts to redress some of its lasting impacts. Let's go now to author Tim Madigan. Sir, the floor is yours. Uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, it's uh, really great to be with you after <clears throat> what has been, uh, frankly, a very intense and meaningful uh, couple of months in my life. Um, my book uh, called The Burning was published in 2001, um, and uh, for 18 years, it sold two copies, and, and then... Uh, uh, and then Watchmen happened on HBO. And uh, one of the two copies evidently was bought by the producers and creator of Watchmen because he used uh, my book as source material for the first 10 minutes of that miniseries, which depicted uh, what happened in Tulsa on May 31st and June 1st of 1921. Uh, and in very realistic way. And then they talked about the fact that my book was source material. And so all of a sudden the book found an audience. Um, and it has continued to be a, a, a part of the discussion of race in America. From, from that point on, um, the night of the premiere of Watchmen, Watchmen wasn't trending on Twitter. Tulsa was trending on Twitter. And people, were, I was told 500,000 people went to the internet to find out whether or not what happened in Tulsa was actually true. They found out, of course, that it was. And then, then with the murder of George Floyd, the reckoning uh, that we've been, uh, racial reckoning that we've been going, uh, uh, experiencing ever since. And then, so uh, most recently, uh, I did a piece of First Smithsonian Magazine uh, on, that ran in April. And, and then I went back and I've been doing interviews with reporters all over the world because truly the eyes of the world were on the United States and on Tulsa when it came to this anniversary because it was uh, the worst act of racial violence in our, in our nation by far. Um, and, but anyway, I, I spent three days in Tulsa uh, over the course of the centennial uh, commemoration and uh, and they rekindled friendships with the descendants of survivors. And it was a truly a profound time, just a very profound time. And something magical was in the air where I would run into people, descendants of survivors would run into each other. They would have these deeply meaningful conversations about their experiences, not only about what happened in Tulsa, about what their lives have been like since. And the last thing I did before I came back, I live in Texas, before I drove back to Texas was I stopped in, into a bookstore to sign copies of my book before I came back, uh, came back here. And uh, the manager 
uh, said, uh, there's someone here who wants to meet you. And it turns in, the reason I think about this is what Dr. Jokes had, had just been talking about was that, uh, and it turned out to be a, probably a 30 year old man who was a distant descendant of a very prominent physician by the name of Dr. A.C. Jackson, who was a graduate of Meharry and was a nationally respected physician and Tulsa's most respected physician uh, who was murdered by the mob uh, on, on June 1st, 1921. And so this young man and I had this conversation about the experience of being in Tulsa at the time of the, at the, time of the, uh, the centennial. And you know, we were both amazed by what the things we had, we had been experiencing. And he, I said to him, I don't know how, to, how do you explain it? And, and he said, I do. I do. Uh, he said, the ancestors have been at work. And I think that uh, that's as good an explanation as, as, as there is perhaps. I mean, these people, many of them died, many of them lost everything, um, but their spirits endure. Uh, and the story endures in terms of what we're going through in this nation right now. Now, I think that uh, the story of Tulsa pretty well known right now. I think it began in, in late May when a, young, when a young black was arrested for allegedly assaulting a, uh, uh, a young white girl uh, or a white girl in, a, in an elevator in Tulsa. The guy's name was Dick Rowland. He was quickly arrested, but the uh, police detectives, the white police detectives pretty quickly determined that there was nothing much to the charges. And I think Roland was being held in the, in the Tulsa County Courthouse as much for his own protection as anything. And it probably would have fizzled out were it not for a headline in one of the white Tulsa papers, which said, to Lynch Negro tonight. And within hours of that appearing, there were hundreds of people uh, who had gathered outside the courthouse either to participate in the lynching or to observe it because at that time in America, lynching had become something of a spectator sport, particularly in uh, towns and cities across the South. Uh, back in Greenwood, the black community, uh, the most prosperous black community in America, uh, known as the Black Wall Street of America, this headline made its way back there too, only this time, uh, the black residents, many of whom are World War I veterans, were determined that they weren't going to let one of their own be killed or treated this way. So they went to the courthouse uh, to offer their services of protection to the sheriff. Uh, the sheriff told them that he, you know, he promised to keep Dick Rowland safe, but on one of the trips to the courthouse, a shot was fired. Both sides were heavily armed. A gunfight broke out. 12 people died at the courthouse in that initial skirmish. Um, the Blacks fell back across Greenwood to prepare for what they knew was to come. Because the moment the shots were fired and the moment those, those Black men appeared at the courthouse, the attention went from Dick Rowland to them. There was a sense of how dare these people, you know, how dare these people, especially after whites were killed in that initial skirmish, so the Blacks knew what was going to happen at 5.08 a.m. There's a signal, some sort of a whistle, up to 10,000 whites who had been marshaled overnight, undoubtedly at the high, by the highest levels of Tulsa society, marshaled at strategic points along Greenwood, started to attack. And while they were initially repelled by the Blacks trying to defend their homes and communities, the Blacks were greatly outnumbered and uh, outgunned. And then the atrocities began. Uh, Dozens and dozens and if not hundreds of people, uh, black people killed in cold blood. Uh, every, almost every business, home, church, school with the, uh, was, was doused in kerosene and torched. Uh, the, it was said that among only the few buildings that survived were outhouses because the mob didn't think that they were worth wasting kerosene on. And by noon of the next day, uh, by the time that the National Guard finally showed up, uh, Greenwood, the black community resembled Hiroshima after the bomb. Um, 
And then, of course, this remarkable conspiracy of silence. For 50 years, it really wasn't spoken of. Uh, the Blacks didn't speak of it because they were afraid. The Whites didn't speak of it because they were ashamed or because Tulsa leaders thought it was a PR problem or because Tulsa residents who participated and probably a third of white Tulsa did were afraid of being prosecuted. Ultimately, no one ever was. Um, and so finally, you know, um, gradually the word got out. Um, uh, the, in 1997, the Tulsa Race Riot Commission was, was formed to, for, to formally investigate what happened. Um, there were national and international stories written then. My book came out, but it really wasn't until Watchmen that I think that the, Tulsa was in, in any significant way restored to the national consciousness. Now, that's essentially the story. And I, and I think that my perspective and my experience is a very important one uh, uh, in this time. Um, because I was born and raised in a small farming community in Minnesota, northern part of Minnesota, where there were, I think, one Black family in the 18 years I lived there. I was oblivious to issues of race in this nation, perhaps willfully so. Uh, eventually, I moved to Texas, where I began to work, live and work around people uh, of different ethnicities for the first time, but still that, that obliviousness and it just that race issues just, just weren't relevant to me. Um, until a day uh, in probably the winter of the year 2000, when my editor at the newspaper in Fort Worth, where I was working, handed me this a, a photo or a uh, print out of this story that talked about something called the Tul Tulsa race riot, which was, as it was known at the time, there was nothing riot about it. It was a massacre, as the President Biden said uh, on June 1st. And I read it and I looked at it, you know, and then talked about uh, 35 square blocks destroyed, uh, 300 people killed, 10,000 people left homeless, uh, on and on and on. And I looked at her and I said, this can't be right. Um, anything this horrible, surely we, have, we would have known about it. Anything this horrible, surely would be one of the kind of the watershed moments of American history. And she said, well, I felt the same way. So she sent me to Tulsa um, to do a newspaper piece on it, which I did. And fortunately in the, in the year 2000, many of the survivors were still alive. So I had the marvelous opportunity and the, really the, the, the great, uh, the great privilege to speak with them, uh, people in their 80s who, who could remember the smoke and the fire and the death and the cruelty and the horror and the evil of that day. Um, I wrote a, so I wrote a piece for the Star-Telegram, my Fort Worth paper, that ran under the headline, Tulsa's Terrible Secret. And on my first trip to Tulsa, I, well, you know, in addition to interviewing survivors, I interviewed a man named Don Ross who is the state representative, an African-American state representative who represented the Greenwood district and who was most responsible for creating the Tulsa Race Riot Commission. And when he, uh, I interviewed him and then he and I went out to dinner and we were making a uh, conversation one night or at this Chinese restaurant. I said, Don, what was it like for African-Americans uh, after the Civil War? And he rose up and he pounded his fist on the table so loud enough so that people, other people in the restaurant turned and looked at us. And he said, and you're one of the educated whites. He said, if we can't count on you to understand, who can we count on? And I was appropriately ashamed. But then the opportunity to write the book came. And in the, in the, in the process of writing the book, I learned that really for the first time, what happened in Tulsa was completely consistent with what was going on in the nation at the time. It wasn't some horrible one-off. It was a metaphor for the Jim Crow era in our, in our nation, unique perhaps only in its magnitude. And I was horrified by what I learned. The, the, the previous presentation talked about how the popularity of the KKK uh, racial violence, uh, uh, blacks being slaughtered by white mobs in cities all across the country, 
um, lynching, African-American soldiers being strung up in their uniforms, uh, the separate but equal nonsense that, uh, uh, that was talked about in terms of Plessy versus Ferguson. But something interesting happened to me, this kind of ignorant white boy from Northern Minnesota, in that learning the history of what of race in this country for the first time, it changed the way I looked at other people, I looked at people different than me. And somehow it opened my heart and gave me more compassion and more curiosity uh, for African-Americans and, and people who have been marginalized. And I, come to, I came to recognize the great wound we had in this country. And, and I became committed to trying to do whatever I could to try to help heal it. Unfortunately, in the, in the year 2001, when the book was published, no one was talking about it. And I had begun to rue the day or begin to, to feel that the day of reckoning that I knew had to come wouldn't come in my lifetime. Well, it's here and it's very painful, but this, need, this needed to happen. And my feeling is, and I'll conclude with this, is that, and I've had this experience with all the people who've been reading my book, especially white people, that for us to really move forward with race, the white people need to learn the history of race in this country. And once they do, I'm convinced that many of them, like me, uh, will have their hearts changed and will realize that uh, 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 we, have a, we have a problem that demands solutions and that uh and hopefully they will want to become part of the part of the solution so anyway i appreciate uh, you having me and and uh and i look forward to hearing the the final presentation mr madigan thank you uh for that very personal account and and the haunting detail of of really a horrific chapter in our nation's history and you know one of the reasons we're doing this hidden history series is to open more eyes to what has happened in our nation's past and how it you know still haunts us to this day you 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 used a, a very interesting term the great wound of our nation that has not yet been healed uh, but this is the type of event where we're trying to keep that discussion moving forward and and hopefully trying to heal that wound uh and i want to remind all the viewers uh watching right now there is a question and answer period at the end of this so if you have any questions please submit them in the q a function at the bottom of your screen there at the zoom there's that little q a button just click that you can type in your questions and we'll get to as many of those as we can after our final presentation so Let's go to Professor Tom Mikaitis uh, from DePaul. The attack on the U.S. Capitol building in Washington, D.C. on January 6th focused attention on the activities and influence of militia groups across the country, especially in the northern Midwest, here in the state of Michigan, unfortunately, and mid-Atlantic regions as well. Many of these groups promote white supremacy, and some of them harbor visions of a violent government overthrow, and they advocate for it openly. Uh, in addition, some members of these groups serve on local police forces, even in National Guard units. Professor Makaitis says these groups have some philosophical foundations in the racist attitudes that have persisted in the country since before the country even really began. So let's get directly to Professor Tom Makaitis right now. Sir, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. I want to extend my thanks to my fellow panelists for those excellent presentations, to the sponsors and to you, the audience, for coming for this. I'm uh, approaching this issue from my out of my work on violent extremism, which includes uh, most recently white supremacy. And uh, <clears throat> I was asked to cover the two topics, and I put them on the title, The Rise of White Supremacy in American Policing. And I thought, wait, those are separate. And as I thought about it a little more, I realized, unfortunately, there is a connection that is part of that painful past and the present that Tim Madigan says all of us have to confront. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the history of white supremacy, uh, like Professor Jelks, I'm also a historian. Um, I'll talk about something that I call the reinvention of racism in the past 20 years, a little bit on Michigan, although it was already covered extremely well, and then policing and white power. Okay, um, well, it's a 1619 project is said so brilliantly, and if you haven't read it, I urge you to, to get that. It's available from the New York Times free. 
you know, white supremacy is baked in the DNA of the country uh, before it was even founded, um, through, from slavery to Jim Crow, to redlining, to blockbusting, to all of the techniques we're all becoming more painfully aware of. But the interesting thing is when <clears throat> slavery ended and, uh, you know, um, you know, legal apartheid even ended with the end of Jim Crow, we didn't see this we didn't see this come to a close. We're still dealing with it. And of course, we also saw, as we just heard in, in, in Tim's excellent presentation about Tulsa, the, the, the waves of extrajudicial violence, except the thing that I would add is they were never entirely extrajudicial because judicial persecution, legal segregation, um, uh, the disproportionate punishment incarceration of people of color um, shaded into uh, extrajudicial forms of violence uh, in cases where police and even police chiefs and local individuals uh, were involved in the birth of the Ku Klux Klan and its revival during the Great Migration as a response uh, to uh, people of color moving north, um, African Americans moving north. There was another wave uh, during the, the civil rights era and the kind of a backlash. And then an excellent book by Kathleen Ballou at the University of Chicago called Bring the War Home talks about how returning Vietnam veterans, white veterans, um, angry about what they'd experienced, um, you know, revived a lot of this extrajudicial racial violence. But their initial target, um, the target of the revived Ku Klux Klan, um, were, were Vietnamese and Laotian uh, refugees on the Galveston coast of Texas. But then, of course, that gave shaded into the militia movement, the posse comitatus movement of the prime crisis, and so on. And then, of course, after Oklahoma City, it temporarily went dormant. It never went away and has revived, uh, as we've seen horrifically in the last two decades. Um, you know, and what I call the reinvention of racism you know, is something I looked a lot at in the book I wrote on violent extremism, that um, in order to be more appealing to a larger section of white society, um, the, the, the racists traded in their clan robes, their swastikas, their SS thunderbolts, and their black garb um, for khakis and polo shirts. Now, I'm being a little flippant here. Of course, you can see all of those ugly symbols of race hatred uh, are still around, but yet there's a larger pool of people who would not wish to call themselves racist, but identify with the ideology. And this new approach has made it sound a bit more respectable for them to do it. So there's no longer the white, you know, there still is, but it, you know, in place of white power, you get people saying, well, no, I'm not, I'm not anti-black, I'm not a racist. I just, I just am proud of being white, or I just like celebrating my European heritage, uh, or this is white nationalism. Other groups are allowed to be proud. Why can't we? Um, sometimes it's referred to as coded racism as well. And it goes into other areas. Um, you know, oh, we're not anti-LGBTQ. We just uphold traditional values. Um, we're not opposed to immigrants, but we just think we should have secure borders or we want to preserve our way of life. Um, we're not opposed to feminism. We're not misogynist. We just think that things work better um, if we have traditional families. Um, i.e. that women you know, know their place and assume their traditional role. And Islamophobia, oh, well, you know, we're not anti-Muslim. Uh, we just think this should be a Christian nation. And of course, we're concerned about terrorism. Ironically, a report came out today saying that domestic terrorism is now the most serious threat to the country, something I and others have been saying for a couple of years now. And then there's this horrible condition of reversing the charges. If you challenge someone's prejudice or their racism, they're gonna say, oh, well, you're being bigoted against me. Um, you don't like my values as if the two were equivalent or feminists are not really interested in equality, they just hate men. Or affirmative action uh, discriminate, discriminates against white males, completely ignoring um, all of the elements of white privilege uh, that, uh, that, that, that those of us who are white have enjoyed, particularly those of us who are white men have enjoyed for most of our lives. And then with that is this very powerful grievance narrative um, that the straight white male is somehow under attack. Despite looking at all the power structures in the country and seeing how that group is still incredibly privileged. And then of course, there were two powerful catalysts in the last two decades with the election first of uh, Barack Obama in 2008, 
which was a powerful stimulus to all of those with this white grievance narrative. Um, there was an increase during his presidency of gun sales. And I'm not just talking about individuals buying a gun for themselves. You're talking about people stockpiling uh, guns and ammunition. There was also, according to the Southern Poverty Law Center and the Anti-Defamation League, a dramatic increase in the number of hate groups and the number of people joining those particular groups. And then, of course, uh, the campaign and election uh, of Donald Trump, who, whatever one says about him, had this, uh, this instinct, if you want to call it, I, I mean, I call it almost a hyena's instinct of sensing blood in the water, uh, sensing weakness, that there's this group of angry people out there and I can tap into them and I'm gonna stimulate that fear and provide what we call in, the, in, the, in terrorism studies an empowerment narrative to go with the grievance narrative. You can do something about this. You can fight back, just join me. And I do work with a center in Germany and if anybody is thinking 1933, Weimar, Germany, you're on the right track because the, the similarity between the ways in which Hitler and the Nazis motivated people and the way the previous president did are not, uh, are, are not a coincidence. The big lie is something that Hitler talked about in Mein Kampf. And what are we dealing with today? The big lie of a stolen election. Victimology was stimulated and then the refusal to condemn um, with the Unite the Right rally, rally in Charlotte, the good people on both sides comment, the debate comment to the Proud Boys stand back and stand by, which by the way, they emblazoned on their merchandise and sold it to raise money. And then of course the demonization, remember what I said that reversing of the charges. Oh, the real problem is not, uh, it's not the white militias, it's Black Lives Matter. Even though in fact, um, the, uh, you know, the, the, the vast majority of Black Lives Matter protests and demonstrations were peaceful. Look at the incredible display of force when they came to Washington last summer, as opposed to the absence of, uh, of, a, of a even suitable security on January 6th when it was a white mob. Um, the refusal, okay, and then of course, moving here, um, I'm a historian, I'm a writer, I very seldom say, uh, a picture is worth a thousand words because I, you know, I, I write a thousand words a lot of time. Uh, a lot of the time, that's the standard length of the op-eds I put in the hill. Um, but I can't deny the power of the iconography. You know, hate is on display here. I tell people that, I tell my students and then everyone, you know, bigots are equal opportunity haters. You're not going to find too many white supremacists who are also anti-Semitic, misogynist, anti-LGBTQ, anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim, uh, anti-anybody who is not like them. And you can see the invoking of the American historical past, the perversion of the symbols of the American Revolution, the, 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 uh, the um, Confederate flag, of course, um, the QAnon symbol in the bottom left, Camp Auschwitz, <clears throat> the corner right with the man, the abbreviation six million was not enough. And, uh, you know, as someone who can, is proud to call himself a progressive Christian, which is a fancy way of saying, I don't think mine is the only the right or the, or the best religion, seeing somebody take that symbol and pervert it into something called Christian nationalism, which is an oxymoron, um, was there as well. The noose was intended for Mike Pence, but I don't think there's an African American in the country who didn't miss the larger significance of that God awful symbol. Um, Michigan, I, you know, I, I'm going to go over this quickly because that clip that Dr. Jelks played was so much better on explaining how <clears throat> the, the, the migration to the north, not only of, of people of, of, of African Americans, but also of white people, some of whom were actually recruited into local police forces because, quote, they knew how to handle blacks. And also um, the stimulation of immigrant fear. The immigrants, the Irish, the Italians, the Poles, various other, were also fighting for equality. And for them, it was remarkably convenient that they were no longer at the bottom of the pile because they now could in fact have another group below them to discriminate against. And many of them also worked in the police and in the police forces took the attitude of protecting quote, good neighborhoods, read white neighborhoods, from black ones. 
And that became part of the dynamic of this. Um, and we also um, saw the, 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 the urban rural split in Michigan, as I understand, is a bit stronger with much higher concentrations of, of, of people of color in Detroit and other places and a rural areas that are overwhelmingly, uh, and in some cases, almost exclusively white. You have the same, you know, you have a strong gun culture. And of course, we've seen numerous incidents, most recently the, the open up rally uh, in, uh, and also the effort to kidnap the governor and, and well, probably murder her. Um, now, the thing I wanna stress though, is the deeper you dig into this problem, the harder it becomes to fall back on simplistic <clears throat> regional uh, statewide generalizations. These problems are everywhere. Um, we all have to deal with them. There are pockets of this in Illinois, Michigan, every single state in the union. They may be concentrated in more in some areas than others, but it's everybody's problem. Racism in American policing, let me say from the out, the, the policing evolved along with the white power structure. Many Southern police forces evolved out of fugitive slave gangs whose express purpose was to hunt down runaway enslaved people and bring them back. Um, you know, police were in the era of the horrible age of era of lynching were often complicit in the lynching, turning over in some cases, maybe even being at the murders of these, of these innocent black men and women. Um, Northern police forces, as I said, you know, took this attitude of, you know, of, of they enforced segregation. I mean, there were, you know, uh, I don't think the idea, of even, even, even in this time, we're still dealing with the, the terrible problem of racial profiling by police. Current data still reveals that white officers are more likely to use force than black officers and far more likely to use it in black neighborhoods than they are in white neighborhoods. Now, part of this, you know, is, is a culture I'm gonna talk about in a little bit, but part of it is demographics. You know, um, the, ra the racial makeup of the police force seldom in the major metropolitan areas reflects the racial makeup of the community, despite the fact that evidence shows that when they match, you do get lower crime rates. Um, there's also the issue of, you know, look at the whole issue of the George Floyd case. Relatively few of the Minneapolis St. Paul police officers live in the neighborhoods they're asked to patrol. So what do you get? You get this mentality of them versus us. Chicago police recruits used to be told, you, we're going out there and you have to, to, to believe that we're the toughest gang on the street. Well, you're, you're going out with a mentality of, uh, of aggression and engagement, not serve and protect. This is no surprise to anybody, the disproportionate number of uh, African-Americans, particularly African-American men killed um, by, uh, by police. And again, you know, for the interest of you know, lack of bias, I deliberately chose something from a BBC British source, not an American one. Now, the militarization of police, this is a huge other area as well. Um, you know, in the 90s, the police were given a tremendous amount of heavy equipment in the, the so-called war on drugs, armored personnel carriers, all kinds of riot gear, et cetera. Um, their training also got more militarized um, as a result. And also there was this, you know, this emphasis on recruiting former military people. Now, let me be clear. I think you know, we obviously owe something to men and women who have served in uniform, but the assumption that military training inherently makes you a good police officer is seriously flawed and very dangerous. Uh, both um, uh, you know, um, Derek Chauvin, uh, who murdered George Floyd, and the man who uh, is going to stand trial for shooting the 13-year-old uh, the in Chicago had military backgrounds. Now, I don't wanna say that that's all there is to it, but it, the idea is, okay, why do they assume that they're gonna be good soldiers? They got weapons training, but the problem is the over-reliance on weapons is, is one of the issues. Dallas Police Department study in 2020, veterans were more likely to use their guns than not veterans. Um, you know, They have a higher incidence of, of excessive force complaints. The training also carries over. It conveys an attitude that we are almost, if you will, at war with some of the communities, or certainly 
opposing them with an aggressive threat kind of posture. And it, what does it do? It invariably provokes, provokes the same kind of response. If somebody gets in your face as a, just an ordinary bump and shove of everyday life, you're gonna respond more aggressively than you would if they were more, if they were, didn't adopt that posture. Um, so you've got this, you've got this kind of thing. And, and of course, you know, pe people who looked at, professionals who looked at the response to the demonstrations following the death of George, the, the murder of George Floyd said the police are not actively engaging. What are they doing? They're out there with a threat posture. And what does it do? It provokes the same thing. In Chicago, we had a fire chief come out, no guns, no problems. He had a conversation with the crowd. He said, I really understand. I hear what you're saying. Now I have to get my fire trucks out. We've got an emergency to deal with. Can you help me do that? The crowd respectfully moved back and did what he asked. What an iconic example of how to do this. Um, uh, the other is, of course, policing and white supremacy. When I say this is a problem, we have got to get beyond this ridiculous, oh, most cops are good, the vast, but there are a few bad apples. It's not about good or bad individual behavior. It's about a culture of systemic racism where police are conditioned to view people of color, particularly African-American men, and particularly if they're large, as inherently threatening. Um, and that's what I'm talking about. It's, it's when we talk about structural inequality, structural racism, systemic racism, it's not about individual bad behavior. Um, it's that's part of it that it leads to it, but it's, it's the culture that, that encourages it or allows it um, that is really the issue. There's a whole bunch of data you can look at. Not only do we have that to begin with, but now we're seeing active efforts on the part of groups like the Oath Keepers, um, which is the largest paramilitary group uh, in the United States. It's a, you know, it's a white supremacist anti-government group that was very active on January 6th. Um, and they actively recruit you know, former military, first responders, police, firefighters, and so on. And there's some evidence even that they, they are recruiting active duty police. And this is one of the things that president's latest statement just came out today, the plan for fighting domestic terrorism was to take a good hard look at police departments and the United States military to start saying, okay, we got to root this out. People may not be aware, but up through the 1970s, it was perfectly okay to be a member of the Ku Klux Klan and be in the United States army as long as you did not openly display this stuff on base. And even then they often got away with it. Um, you know, we saw the case of uh, the uh, young man in, from Illinois who's going to be tried in uh, Wisconsin for showing up at the Kenosha demonstrations after the shooting there. And the response he gets is to be handed a bottle of water and have police say, we appreciate you being here. Compare that to the response given to Peaceful Black Lives Matters. And there's pictures of him, as you've seen, walking down the street with an assault rifle, an AR, looks like an AR-15, and nobody is um, in fact, the police are not doing anything to apprehend him or do anything else. Um, we found that the, there's all kinds of data on this. I don't wanna just read this to you, but you can look at any of it. Um, you know, two thirds of the, of the Oath Keepers have some sort of military or police background according to leaked data. Um, and some, you know, some have been suspended. We saw that in, on January 6th, some of those police officers were not only not trying to stop the breach of the Capitol, they were actively, uh, you know, taking selfies with some of these individuals. Okay, the takeaways, if I can wrap up what I'm saying here. Um, I, I want to return to just the, the really excellent points that my fellow panelists made. The past is very much present. Tim Madigan made that point. So did Randall Jokes with his discussion of, uh, of excellent discussion of medicine. Um, this stuff has to be taught. I wrote a piece a week or two ago for The Hill on how Oak, what is Oklahoma doing with the Tulsa race riot, riot? They've passed a law saying you cannot teach anything that makes students feel um, uncomfortable, um, which means what they want, it's really about, the whole thing is not teaching critical race theory as though this is some big pernicious ideology. All it is is a call for an honest, engagement with the American past that is holistic. You can 
celebrate the accomplishments of Thomas Jefferson, but you have to say that he was able to do those things because he lived off the labor of the enslaved people he was allowed to own. That's what it's about. But what they want in Oklahoma and elsewhere is essentially a mythology of American history, a celebratory vision that is you know, pushes things like manifest destiny and everything else and tells you Native American and American relations were epitomized by Thanksgiving and, and, and all kinds of other things. Um, and you know, it's exactly this kind of teaching. 83% of the people in Oklahoma had never heard of the Tulsa race massacre until they were adults. Why? It's not taught in the schools. Now they're legally trying to prevent it. Racism is not an attack on white people. Um, you know, the, it's not about you kind of thing. And I, I share everything Tim Madigan said, having grown up in a culture in which I was ignorant of most of this white working class culture in Western New York. Um, and to be honest, complicit in a lot of it, not out of malice, just out of ignorance and realizing, okay, yes, it's painful to talk about this stuff, but it has to be done. And it's not an indictment of me or anyone else as an individual. It's an effort to deal with painful social realities. And then finally, we've got to get beyond this, oh, it's the good cops are the majority and you know, it's just the bad apples that have to be weeded out. No, it's the tree the apples grow on. That's the problem. The institutions are flawed. I would like to see us go to public safety uh, departments in which, yes, there are armed police. I don't deny the need for those, but does every traffic officer have to have a gun? Can we not hire more social workers? Can we not have people who are trained mental health professionals and so on? So those are the things I would urge you to take away. Um, I won't go through the list of books here. As I said, I will, um, you know, Whistling Volvely is excellent. Kendi's book is great. And Catherine Ballou's book on Bring the War Home is a great look at white power. With that, I will stop. Uh, I know we want to go to questions and answers. I want to thank everyone who's here tonight again for engaging with us in this important conversation. Professor Moctitis, thank you very much. Uh, fascinating, uh, certainly gives new meeting and some depth to the term to serve and protect that you see on a lot of police cars these days. Um, and we're gonna go now to the Q and A section here. I'm gonna put on my glasses so I can uh, see what we've got. Uh, several people have submitted questions so far and one of them comes from a teacher named Amy. Can you panelists comment on the effort to ban the teaching of critical race theory in the classroom? As a high school history teacher in this community, a community in which the long reach of racism is still very apparent, I welcome your guidance on how to integrate this approach into, the, into classroom instruction, especially given the overall conservative political bias of Southwest Michigan. It, it is an interesting place. Uh, we, we live here in, in Southwest Michigan. If you know anything about uh, the twin cities of Benton Harbor and St. Joseph, you know they are not exactly identical twins. Uh, St. Joe is wealthy, uh, beach town, mostly white. Uh, Benton Harbor is economically depressed, uh, vacant buildings and about 86 percent black so uh and, and there's long been a divide uh the, the the old joke though it's not very funny is uh the bicentennial bridge between benton harbor and saint joe is less than a mile long but it feels like the longest bridge in america because you're going between two different communities so um let, let's start with you, Dr. Jelks. What do you think about this effort to ban critical race theory? And is that is that the right title for it? Or is that just some kind of um, boogeyman type of, of, of name? Given we, should, we should ban Plato and Aristotle and we should ban <laughs> Aquinas and we should ban anybody who thinks critically, right? I mean, the critical race theory uh, developed uh, by law professors. Uh, they were trying to understand uh, the ways that the law worked. Um, but the, the information presented here um, was begun before critical race theory was even a mode in politicians' mouths, right? You didn't have to go to critical race theory to go to the archives and dig up the stuff I dug up on, on, on Michigan. Uh, you, and you could conclude 
Um, the same thing, a person who might argue about critical race theory, wow, this is, this is, this is really, really troubling. So, so I think it's a boogeyman. There are always interpretive theories. And, you know, I teach my students all, all the time. There are always interpretive theories. The, the, the question is, does it fit the evidence that you dug up? And most of us who, are, who work in any kind of history, you wind up digging up evidence. You just don't go around saying accusations. Was the N-word used on the floor of Congress uh, even until uh, the 1950s? Uh, absolutely. It's a matter of the congressional record. So how should we interpret that on the floor of the Congress? These are the, these are the questions. I think this is more political distraction than it is a reality. And I think some of the legal professors who are great legal minds ought to be read first and then judge on their, their merit. Now, Derek Bell, who was a Harvard University law professor, one of the sort of framers of critical race theories and, and others ought to be read um, uh, before we, we move on. Um, and most people haven't even read what they wrote and why they wrote it. Hey, they just hear the words critical race theory and their heads explode, I guess. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Madigan, what, what's your take on that? How, how, you know, there are some states that are literally, you know, outlawing teaching kinds of things in schools. How should teachers handle that uh, in, in a delicate way? I wouldn't want to be a teacher right now. Um, uh, the superintendent of uh, Fort Worth Public Schools and, and his counterpart in Dallas sent, uh, sent a very powerful note to the state legislators saying, if we want to prepare our students, they need to know the real history. And if you think that, and if you think that it, by denying them this is going to serve them well, you've got another thing coming. I think a lot of this has to do, it plays into, uh, it plays into what the previous guys have been talking about was just how desperate uh, the people are to preserve the status quo, particularly when it comes to race and to preserve and to preserve white privilege. And I think, uh, again, it's couched in the sense of we don't want our kids to feel bad or we don't want people to feel bad about America or anything. Basically, it all it is is we don't want what's happening in this country to continue. We don't want this discussion to take place. We want to go back to the way it was in the 1950s, um, and so it's just it's just it sickens me um, that, that this is happening, given how important education is. And I've come to develop this kind of theory in terms of where you know for for us to get to where we want to go in this country in terms of true ra racial healing reconciliation, three A's need to happen. One is awareness. People need to know, American people, white Americans need to know, as painful as it is to look at what, the true, what our true race history is. Then apology. Someone in a position of authority needs to say they're sorry for what happened and then amends. And you know those amends are gonna, it's a very complicated thing. But to go back to the 50 years from 1921 to 1971 when the first magazine article of the massacre was written, when there's a, you know, Tulsa is a metaphor for everything we're talking about, including how our race history has been willfully hidden for um, this really unfortunate mythology that we've been talking about here tonight. Professor Moktaitis, your take on, on the banning of critical race theory, and, and is that just another one of those terms, uh, you know, that you used? Uh, the, you, you know, to say we we celebrate our European heritage or or something like that is critical race theory becoming one of those buzzwords. It's politically expedient for those on the right, and uh, Dr. Jux is absolutely right. Um, the people who are throwing it about have no idea what it really is. A bunch of legal scholars in the '70s and '80s said, "Look, we've passed the Voter Rights Act, we've passed the Fair Housing Act." but there still is inequality. Why? Because it isn't simply a matter of individual policies and behaviors. It's about systemic racism. Let's look at that and let's include it. I can say that 60 years ago, 
we didn't teach women's history because we decided that, oh, the only thing that mattered was, uh, you know, to study what we call in the field dead white males because they did all the important things. Well, that, that now is laughable. Um, and the world didn't end because we did that. That's all this is about. Um, and I, what I also think is it's a, for the teacher, I, I want to be helpful as I taught high school at one point. Um, it, you know, I want us to get to a holistic history. You know, what do we do now? We, we can concentrate this. So oh, here's your Black History Month. Now leave us have the other 11. Or here's Women's History Month. No, you have to integrate all these themes in holistically. And it isn't about guilt. It isn't about anything else. Although I totally agree with Tim that there is needs to be amends and apology and awareness. But awareness starts with education. Mm -hmm. The education is not the blame game. It's about an inclusive view of the past. If I can make a, a point real quickly to it, and, and, and not to take away from anything I just said, though, given the nature of the reality that, that people are looking for an excuse to, to retrench, mm -hmm. I don't think we should make it easy for them. I think critical race theory is just that kind of term that people can grab on crit critical, critical, the, the term critical in theory is that kind of term that those people can latch on to. And the term woke, I think, is very unfortunate because it's, I think it's condescending. It says you're either with us or you're against us. You know, it's, it's again, a source of division. It gives those people ammunition. So I think that the reality is the same, but I think we have to be somewhat more strategic as in terms of how we put it out there because too often, we're just making it easy for these people to be ridiculous. Interesting, guys. Thank you very much. Oh, Can I just add on. one very quick thing? And this is something too. Those of us who are white and white educators need to follow and listen, not lead, not be the ones to step in and say, well, here's how we should do it. Because I think in some ways, that's also part of the problem. Uh, all right, let's go to a question from uh, a viewer named Elizabeth. And she says, quote, as a 2005 Spelman College graduate, I am definitely biased with this question. At least she's honest. Uh, but I would like to know if our panelists who presented on the roles of HBCUs believe HBCUs are still relevant and necessary in our country today. Gentlemen, what are you? Uh, so I so I raised the question, and uh, I, I've written a book about Spelman's uh, brother college, Morehouse College. So I'll I'll try to answer that. Absolutely, the answer is yes. Uh, historically, black colleges and university and other minority-serving institutions around the United States are highly relevant. Uh, they continue to produce the most uh, black professionals uh, in the country. Uh, Spelman College, uh, bar none, uh, is, uh, you know, I wanted to go to Spelman and not because it's all women, it's an all women's college. <laughs> <laughs> a choice, by the way. I wanted to go to Spelman because I, I visited there uh, uh, in high school, going to visit Morehouse, which my uncle wanted me to go to. And I saw uh, the graduates of Spelman. And at the end of it, I felt like, well, that's the place I want to be because there were writers, there were doctors, there were nurses to uh, inspire. And of course, Spelman College is the uh, place where uh, uh, Stacey Abrams uh, graduated from. My dear friend and good friend, Tairi Jones, novelist and writer. I, yes, the, the answer is yes. And as a kid who spent the first half of his life in the South, in, New, in the city of New Orleans, where there are three historically black colleges, Southern University of New Orleans, um, Xavier University, uh, the only historically black Catholic college and uh, Dillard University, uh, of course, I believe uh, uh, that these continue, but there is still so much more, uh, and there's still much more room uh, for the other institutions to learn from um, the historically black college uh, colleges. I wrote a biography of the president of uh, the distinguished president of, of one of those schools, Benjamin Elijah Mays, and 
he should have been a shining example of what a university or college president uh, should be like in any time, in any age. Interesting. Uh, Professor Moctitis, you obviously teach at, at DePaul University. Mm -hmm. What's your take on HBCUs? I'm, I'm, I have to say, well, yes, I totally agree with everything you said, and I particularly agree with Dr. Joseph's conclusion, we need to do more. And for colleges and universities like mine, the more is hiring more faculty of color, doing a better job of retaining, creating an atmosphere that not only offers specific courses, but provides an atmosphere of support for all students. And I think one of the real problems with universities is because we have an intellectual understanding that racism is wrong, therefore we have dealt with the issue. And I think that is one of the most dangerous assumptions I see. I think there's still too much of saying, this is only the problem of the group that has been oppressed and the rest of us need to just give them resources and, and then we don't have to do anything. It's, you know, it's just up, say the right thing. So uh, yeah, the, I, my, I speak from the point of view of we need to be more, including my own university, do more, excuse me. Mr. Madigan, I have a, a, a separate question specifically for you from one of our viewers, if that's all right. Her name is Audrey, and she asks, quote, Mr. Madigan, did you interview any survivors who aided and abetted in the Tulsa massacre, such as healthcare workers who turned Black victims away, law enforcement who failed to respond, et cetera? As a nurse, she says, I cannot imagine refusing anyone care. I think exploring the stories of these people might shed some light on today's troubles. Did you meet anybody like that? I've had, I've got a version of that question a lot in the last few months. And uh, the short answer is no. Um, and uh, it speaks to the, the nature of the conspiracy of silence uh, that was really, really quite remarkable. But we were doing the math. Um, um, so Tulsa was a city of about 80,000 people, um, 10,000 of whom were African-American. If I'm, my math is correct, that leaves 70,000 people in the city. Uh, and you saw half of, just assume that half of those 70,000 were children. So that leaves us 35,000, uh, 35,000 adults, white people living in Tulsa in 1921. And the size of the mob was estimated to be up to 10,000 people. That means there's a one in three chance, roughly, that, 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 that if you were white, you were part of the atrocity. And, and the generations, uh, and that has been passed down through generation. And in my, my recent week work, I've, talk, I've done a lot of work on generational trauma for the, uh, for the African-American, for the descendants of African-Americans. I wonder what it was like, and I think more work, more work needs to be done. What was it like for the descendants of the people who participated in the killing and in the burning? And, or either did it implicitly or complicitly, like, this, like your question says, you, you, you abetted it by not standing up against it. You abetted it by not treating the wounded. Uh, you know, I think there's, I think there's a whole nother facet of this that needs to be unspooled uh, if we really want to try to understand, because not only just in Tulsa, uh, I've done, you know, I've done work about the descendants of, of people who participated in lynchings here in Fort Worth and the trauma of that act that as it was passed on generations uh, through generations is, is significant. Um, and I think that it speaks to the shame we feel uh, over, over our history. And, and the fact that it, it's only made worse by the fact that it hasn't been addressed and it's been kept hidden. And, and those things, that shame can, will have its way. Uh, those feelings will have their way collectively and individually over time. Interesting. Uh, we're running out of time. I want to give you each uh, a minute or two for some uh, closing thoughts. And, and we just had an anonymous viewer uh, ask a question. What are your thoughts on how we can begin to address the more personal elements of internalized racism, especially with increased mental health and physical health issues? Uh, and and I'm, I'm not sure I understand exactly where they're getting at on that one. But what are your closing thoughts? How do we how do we get beyond this? Where where do we go from here, Dr. Jelks? Let's start with you. 
where do we go from here? That's a you know book by Martin Martin Luther King Jr. That was what you know chaos or community. That was the 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 subtitle of that book. Where do we go from here? Is it chaos or community? We have a little bit of both right now, frankly. Well, I mean, but we 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 do have to have a struggle with one another, uh, whether it's in, in in protests on the street or that is democracy. And democracy is, I always tell my students um, in Kansas who have never ridden the subway before, is you're rubbing up against everybody on the Chicago L uh, and that's part of democracy. Some people smell really good. Some people don't smell that good. And we, we have to learn how to continue to negotiate out uh, and to negotiate out our fears, to negotiate out our uh, uh, our hopes and aspirations, and um, and and that takes a, a amount of uh, uh, spiritual energy and courage uh, that uh, we we've, we've not had a lot from our leaders uh, uh, about. So I think I think that uh, where where we're going from here, uh, we continue to advocate, and I continue to advocate for building communities. Uh, there are all kinds of different communities and we have to negotiate with one another and listen to one another uh, and where we have common interests come together, where we have differences, we have to argue them out in a way that we do not go to war. We do not want war, no question about that. Uh, Professor Makaitis, your final thoughts? Yeah, I, I think as many opportunities like the one we're engaging in tonight um, happen, I, at my church and a neighboring synagogue have partnered to have these conversations. And uh, it, it's amazing when you establish trust, the willingness of people to share how much they have personally struggled, how much, as Tim said so well, we all have these attitudes and ideas that were unfortunately part of the culture and the air that we breathe. And by unpackaging them, having education, um, you know, and I celebrate the diversity of America. I mean, uh, and I didn't grow up in an America that was diverse. And I, I, I'm, I'm glad I'm, that we're gonna bequeath that to my grandchildren, so. It is certainly a diverse nation. Uh, Mr. Madigan, I think you get the final word tonight. Well, I spent uh, my three days in Tulsa, I spent them uh, almost exclusively with black people. And, uh, and, and I said to them, partially in jest, I said, if I'd have known it was gonna be this, this much fun hanging out with black people, I'd have started doing it a long time ago. Uh, the, uh, you know, but that's the thing. We don't, we don't know what we're missing. We haven't, um, by not availing ourselves of the relationships with people who are different than we are, we don't know what we're missing. And I think we're gradually going to find out. I do think the genie's out of the bottle. We're, there's no going back. However, you might want to try to stuff the genie back in the bottle by saying you cannot teach this or you cannot do this or you cannot do that. It's not going back in. We, the reckoning, has begun, it will continue. However, I think the next 10 years or next generation, you know, centuries will not be undone and healed in a year. I think that I think the next 10 year decade, next generation, it's gonna be a very painful and kind of frothy time in our country. Uh, I just don't see any, any other way. But I think what we need to do, the right attitude to take is to be steady to be compassionate and uh, just try to keep moving forward in a way that uh, that that uh, con contributes to a finding of a common humanity rather than uh, rather than uh, the divisions that uh, have been afflicting us for so long. Gentlemen, thank you. As a parent uh, of four young people ranging from 19 to 12, uh, they give me hope. The next generation gives me hope. They seem to be more accepting uh, than their parents and certainly their grandparents were of people who have differences, no matter what they are, whether it's you know racial, physical, uh, religious, all, all kinds of differences. So um, we're gonna end uh, quickly here with a brief message from one of our sponsors, Dr. Lynn Todman of Spectrum Health Lakeland. Let's listen to this. 
Hello, and thank you for joining us on this hidden history journey. I'm Lynn Todman, Vice President of Health Equity at Spectrum Health Lakeland. Since April of this year, our expert panelists have shared little known aspects of our nation's history, history that continues to impact the health of black Americans today. Several points made in these panel discussions struck me. For instance, like how the business of slavery profited companies in both the North and the South. How legislators passed laws restricting the nighttime movement of black people, essentially criminalizing skin color. How the belief in black inferiority predated the American Revolution and was baked into our founding documents. How bands of Southern law enforcement officers roamed Northern states with impunity to recapture enslaved people who had fled the South. How even the denim jeans we wear today are rooted in the work of enslaved people. But what was particularly striking was the clear link between this history and the health of black people today. The series made it clear that we cannot divorce today's health inequities from our nation's history. To heal the trauma of racism, as we aim to do in Community Grand Rounds, I challenge everyone to lean into our collective responsibility to understand this history and its role in harming the health of black communities. To that end, please join us for a Juneteenth celebration this Friday and Saturday, June 18th and 19th, to honor the emancipation of slaves in the United States. The event will take place in the Dwight Mitchell Park in Benton Harbor, and will feature a parade, guest speakers, performers, and vendors, all gathered to make this a very special event in our community. Thank you. That was Dr. Lynn Todman there from Spectrum Health Lakeland. And that concludes our Hidden History panels, but you can continue to learn about this important and too often overlooked aspect of U.S. culture. We've got a whole list of resources in the Zoom chat down at the bottom uh, of your screen there. We encourage everyone to continue the conversation at home and learn more about the hidden history of the U.S. And if you'd like to see the first and second panels, if you didn't see those covering early, earlier portions of U.S. history, they're available on YouTube. You'll also get an opportunity in just a few moments to answer a survey about tonight's discussion. So if you would, please take the time to respond. We welcome your feedback. And if you want to pursue these topics on a more personal level here in Southwest Michigan, please investigate Brave Talks. Those are small group meetings that are part of the Community Grand Rounds Initiative through Spectrum Health Lakeland. And once again, thank you to our very esteemed panelists, Professors Randall Jelks and Tom Makaitis and writer Tim Madigan. Fascinating stuff. And thanks again to our sponsors, Spectrum Health Lakeland, Lake Michigan College, and the St. Joseph Michigan City Commission. I'm Brian Connie Bear from ABC 57. Keep the conversation going at your house and with your neighbors. We'll see you later. <laughs>